Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 28th meeting of 2019. We have no apologies. Agenda item one is the decision on taking items three and four in private, which are to consider the evidence heard today and discuss our draft secure care report. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is an evidence session on petition 1458 in the name of Peter, Peter Cherby calling on the Parliament to establish a register of judicial interests. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. I welcome our witness for this morning, Moya Ali, former judicial complaints reviewer. Regrettably, Mr Peter Cherby is unable to be here this morning, and I wish him a speedy recovery. Um, I take this opportunity uh, to refer members to the recent letter received from the Lord President on this petition. We now move to questions from members, starting with John Finney. Much been here. Good morning, Ms Ali, and uh, thank you for your written submissions. <coughs> I wonder, just to start with, maybe you could outline um, <coughs> the nature of the problem as it's perceived and whether um, that problem is actual bias or per perceived bias. Please. The short answer is I think it's a mix of both and I think the problem is that without a register of interests it's very very difficult for people to work out whether there is an issue or not. Um, there, are, there are perceived concerns, I, I acknowledge that, but I think that is an issue in itself. I think there are, for example, not... Um, any real issues about public board members, for example, um, getting involved in, in deals that they shouldn't get involved in. I don't think there's evidence for that, but we, still, we are still required to complete a register of interests, as indeed are MSPs. So, in a way, I don't think the issue is whether there's any real bias, um, although I have been sent evidence that there is. But for me, the issue is one of perception. I think that's very important because having confidence in the judicial system is important. So we want justice delivered, but we also want justice to be seen to be delivered. And I think that's very much about openness and transparency. Thank you for that. You're a former judicial um, complaints reviewer. I wonder if you could maybe give us a, an outline of the sort of complaints that you would have dealt with and whether they would inform this particular debate, please. Um, yes, I, I think I can. I think the difficulty that I had as Judicial Complaints Reviewer, JCR, was very much um, that people tended not to escalate the JCR because it was known that I had no powers, that there was nothing I could do. The, the complaint system is such that judges investigate complaints about judges, and then at the end of that process, there is what I can only be described as a little bit of window dressing, where um, the final stage is that there is somebody called a JCR, it's set out in statute, but that individual has no powers. So they can't change a decision, they can't overturn it, they can't actually do anything about it at all. Their only power is to look at whether the complaints process was followed. And the complaints process is simply about, did you write to the complainant within the five-day time scale, or did you send them a response within 10 days? It's, it's that kind of thing. So actually, you're not, you're not looking in detail at the complaint or the details of the complaint. You're simply looking at whether a process was followed. So it's very different to the system in England and Wales. And, and what was the sort of complaints that you were receiving, or you were having to have oversight of the pr process about, please? Oh, a wide range of things from judicial conduct um, in the sort of private world, you know, the way judicial office holders conducted themselves um, when they were not um, acting as judges, for example, but also things that happened in the courtroom, behaviour, rudeness, unsympathetic approaches, sometimes conflicts of interest. And uh, is there anything that, that we can learn from elsewhere, for instance, uh, I'm advised that or the petitioner has indicated that judicial registers operate successfully elsewhere and gives the example of Norway, which is often used as a comparator for Scotland. Are you aware of this system there? I'm not, I have to say I'm not an expert in, in registers of interest for the judiciary, but what I, I am passionate about is openness and transparency in public life. And to me, that's the fundamental issue. This 
in many ways, isn't about a register of interests. It's about public office holders in various guises, whether people like you um, in politics or people like me um, on boards in public life or people like judges taking decisions about people's lives, whether there is a requirement on people like us representing wider society to be open and transparent in our dealings. And for me, that's the fundamental issue. And there is a very clear answer. Yes, we have to be open and transparent. Thank you very much indeed. I wonder if we could just follow up on um, no powers other than to look at the process, see if it's been followed. What powers would you um, suggest that the JCR should have? Well, probably a good example is the role that I have at the moment. Um, I'm the independent assessor of complaints for the Crown Prosecution Service in England and Wales. Um, so, in a way, it's a similar job in that I independently review complaints. I think the difference is that when I was JCR, I simply looked at the process, whereas now I can overturn a decision. I can reach a different decision about the outcome of a complaint. And I believe very strongly that the JCR ought to be able to do that. What I found frustrating as JCR was I could look at a complaint and based on the evidence, I couldn't understand how a particular decision had been reached. Um, but I had no power to say, look, that's nonsensical. That needs to be looked at again. I could simply say, well, you followed the rules, therefore I don't uphold the complaint. So in terms of the powers that I believe the JCR ought to have, they ought to be allowed to look at the whole complaint and reach a different outcome and have a conversation with the Lord President about what can be done to remedy that complaint instead of simply ruling on whether the process was followed or not. Yes, when you say overturn a decision, are you actually looking at the decision of a case where there may be an appeal pending? No, no, not the legal. It's important that there's a distinction between legal decisions that judges make and clearly we have to have an independent judiciary and nobody should get involved in overturning legal decisions. It's simply about service elements. So, for example, if a judge is rude to somebody in court, that's not a legal decision, that's a service decision. So I don't believe that, that anybody, any non-judicial office holder, ought to overturn legal decisions. However, if somebody has made a service complaint and, it, and other judges investigate that and decide that that complaint is not upheld, I think if the JCR looks at the evidence in that case, and cannot understand why the complaint was not upheld, they ought to have the power to ask the Lord President to look at that complaint again, but certainly not to look at legal decision-making, no. So um, if the, the JCR have had a complaint, it's been referred to the, the, the judiciary, and they've in effect said, we're not going to do anything about it, you feel that you should have the, the power, or the JCR you know, in the position, should have the power to be able to say, no, I think this is a legitimate claim, look again. And that's about something about rudeness, something that happened in the court, something that, that wasn't quite right. Yes, because otherwise, what's the point in having a JCR? What's the point in having a third tier when the third tier can't actually do anything? There, there is actually no point in having a JCR. And that's why I describe it as window dressing, because if you can look at a complaint but you can't do anything about it, then why look at it? Helpful clarification. And... James. Uh, thank you, Convener. And can I just uh, draw the committee's attention to my previously declared register of interest and in that my brother Tony Kelly is a sheriff within the sheriffdom of Glasgow and Strathkelvin. Um, ju just uh, following on from that, just to give a, a bit more of a kind of context for this, uh, in relation to these service complaints, you said you gave an example of one of, you know, a, a judge being rude. Can you give, maybe give some other examples of what would uh, merit a service complaint? Um, let me think. Um, they might, I mean, they might be um, behaviour outside of the courtroom. I vaguely remember a complaint about um, somebody out walking their dog who was shouted at by a judge and she felt afraid. It was, you know, she was in an isolated place and felt afraid. So, so conduct. Um, I vaguely, again, you have to forgive me, it was several years ago that I was JCR. Um, somebody felt that 
that they had been the victim of disability discrimination, that um, their requirements were not taken on board when they were giving evidence in court. So, I mean, those, those kinds of things. It, it covers a wide range. I mean, it's really any concern that somebody has that is not a legal concern to do with their case, that, that would be a service complaint. So, um, conduct of a judge, you know, if they, if they feel that... So, it wouldn't be things like... If, if somebody felt that the judge gave more airtime to one witness than another, that would be a legal complaint because clearly it's up to the judge to decide how to handle evidence within a court. Um, but if they felt that the judge was rude to them but perfectly polite to somebody else, that would be a service complaint. It, it, it's quite difficult to give examples because they're all so varied. Um, and could the, does a service complaint pertain to a specific legal case or can it relate to the judge's general conduct? You give an example of something that happened outside the courtroom. Could, it could be general conduct, inside or outside the courtroom. It could be about a specific instance, or it could be more generally um, perhaps a concern about bias because a, a, a judge is a member of a particular society. Or It, it really covers a very wide range of things. Okay. Um, I mean, I suppose the, the issue with this petition is, the kind of key question is whether there's... there's the risk of any bias in the judicial system and whether in terms of the current system the, the current safeguards are adequate. So in terms of the current system you've obviously got the judicial oath, you've got the straight statement of principles of judicial ethics, you've got the powers to investigate judges, so there, there are those safeguards that are there. How effective do you think those are to ensure that you know there's no bias in the system and there's no conflict of interest arising well it's the third of those that i'd like to pick up on because that's really my field of expertise which is around the whole complaints process and i think that's where my concerns lie because we have a system in which if there is a complaint about a judge it is investigated by another judge it's a very we live in a small country and we have a small group of judges who are all known to each other. So it's quite a difficult scenario in which you're investigating somebody else you know. And then because the, the oversight role of the JCR is a powerless one, I don't think we do have a robust complaint system. And therein, I think, lies the problem. But I think over and above all of that, even if we had a really good, robust system for investigating complaints that had genuine independent oversight, even if we had that, I still think there's a requirement for a register of interests because it's really about the 21st century. Since the 20th century, public board members and politicians have had to register interests. It's just normal commonplace practice and I cannot really understand why we should allow one group of people taking very important decisions not to be required to do that. So, so you're submitting a position where you believe that in terms of the powers to investigate judges um, because judges are allowed to effectively investigate within the, their own pool um, you feel that process is weak and uh, is not fair and transparent. Have you got any evidence or examples to, to back that up? Well, obviously, because um, the f the f their findings are not seen out with that small circle. I mean, for example, in England and Wales, I was involved in the system there at the same time that I was JCR. And as JCR, I didn't see the outcome of complaints unless they came to me. Whereas in England and Wales, if people challenged there was a, a genuine ind independent oversight and a panel of people would look at that complaint and could actually overturn that finding or impose a more serious sanction which had to be accepted um, by the judiciary. And the findings of investigations were published on a website. So people, a bit like um, complaints about other professional groups like doctors, nurses, surveyors, solicitors, those kinds of things where findings are publicly available and people can look at the outcome. In Scotland, with complaints about the judiciary, that doesn't happen. So you can't go and have a look and see um, 
how many complaints and what the outcome was for particular judicial office holders. That, that simply doesn't happen, but it, it does elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Ian McCarthy. Good morning, Ms Ali. Um, obviously, you've set out um, the, the, the case for a register of interests and, and, and the rationale behind that, but of course, uh, this petition has already um, uh, secured uh, the achievement of a register of recusals. Um, and I just wondered what your view was on the benefits that that, that register um, had uh, had brought to the system in terms of, of transparency, and and what the, the rationale is for um, going beyond that to the register of interest. What the register of interest gives you that the, the register of recusals will never be able to, to give you, uh, however well it operates. I think the register of rec recusals is welcome because it's clearly a step forward and I think probably wouldn't have happened had it not been for this petition. So that is certainly welcome. I think there are concerns about it. As far as I understand, there are no, um, no JPs on that list, for example, which I find surprising given that JPs have another life um, and, and lots of contacts within their other life and their day job and so on. It's surprising that there has been there have been no recusals there. But I think for me the more fundamental issue is that it is up to the judicial office holder to take the decision. So they have knowledge of their own um, interests. Nobody else has that knowledge. They have it and they then take a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. And, no, and if they don't recuse themselves, um, the people before them don't have the information to challenge that, whereas if there are a register of interests, it could be more proactive, so people could look at the register and then go to court and say, well, I'm sorry, I, I actually think there is a conflict of interest here because I've consulted the register of interests and you have a connection with this or that, and that concerns me. With the register of recusals, it's up to the judicial office holder to decide whether there is conflict of interest or not. And that takes the power out of the hands of the people who appear before the judiciary. And I suppose that's my concern. But again, I, I mean, I, I'm sounding a little bit like a stuck record, but I think over and above that, even if the register of recusals worked, there is a fundamental principle about openness and transparency that I feel should extend across all of society, all of public life. Um, so even if it worked, and I'm not convinced that it does, I think there is still a need for a register of interests. Both with the register of interests and the register of recusals um, be the same issue around reliance on the individual to, to either recuse themselves or to register that interest. And therefore, you wouldn't necessarily find yourself terribly um, much further forward as, as a result of a register of interests. You would, because um, if you had clear criteria set out, clear requirements on what needed to be registered and what didn't, um, then judicial office holders could then meet those requirements and register their interests. And then that knowledge, that information would be in the hands of everyone. And then anyone could use that to challenge whether there was an interest or not in a case. But without that register, you're relying solely upon the judicial office holder to take that decision. And the people appearing before that person don't have that knowledge to make that challenge. So it would be a step forward because it would be about sharing the information that at the moment only the judicial office holder knows. And it might be that they feel that they don't have an interest. Somebody else, if they ha had that information, might feel that they did. And at least you could have an open and transparent discussion about that and resolve it before the case. What you don't want is for people to turn up on the day and then find actually that the judicial office holder, having looked at the papers for that day, um, has concerns that they maybe have an interest. So I think by having it publicly declared and available in advance, a lot of that work can be done in advance. So I can't see any disadvantage to it. I can see only advantage. That I, I suppose you've still got an issue around 
whether or not a, a recusal is uh, is appropriate and and one can certainly envisage circumstances where there would be a difference of opinion as to whether or not uh, an interest merited uh, recusal in in, the, in um, circumstances around a particular case but ultimately that decision will have to be taken by somebody should it be taken by judges should it be taken by individual sheriffs um, should it be taken by the lord president uh, is there a mechanism for 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 arbitrating there or will it or, or will it still rest as it does at the moment with with the individual judges and sheriffs goodness you're, you're asking me very detailed questions i think are things that need to be looked at down the line i suppose for me the first thing is the issue of principle if is the principle that people ought to register their interests? And if so, then let's look at the detail of how that might work. Um, so yes, of course, you're going to have scenarios where one party feels there's an interest and the judicial office holder maybe feels that there isn't. But at least with a register, you can have that discussion, whereas at the moment, that isn't even happening because it's purely for the judicial office holder to take a decision and to recuse without there being any opportunity to discuss or to challenge that. So I don't personally have an issue with the judicial office holder taking that decision, but taking it openly and transparently with an opportunity for there to be a challenge before a case goes ahead. That um, individuals may see an opportunity uh, almost to, to, to challenge the validity of an individual judge or sheriff um, presiding over a, over a case irrespective of the circumstances of, of, of their, their, their case. In a sense, you have two separate um, processes kind of running in, in, in parallel. I mean, I, I, I'm sure there are wider arguments, but I, I can see that as being one of the concerns that you, you have a register which opens up um, a, a, a line of attack, if you like, on uh, members of the judiciary um, that in a sense distract from the, the, the facts and circumstances of individual cases an example, a, a similar example, I sat for many years as the chair of uh, disciplinary panels for nurses and midwives and there similar issues came up if, you know, some of the panel members would know people from a particular health board or health trust and they would have to declare that openly within a hearing um, and set out what they believed their interest was and it could be challenged and ultimately the panel sitting on the case would decide and if it was felt that, in fact, there was an interest, um, if the um, defendant, in inverted commas, felt that there was an interest, they could have that judicially reviewed. In practice, it was very straightforward. Somebody would declare an interest. There would be discussion about whether that was a material interest or not. Usually, I think probably in all cases, a view was reached about whether there was or there wasn't, and then the case would go ahead or... or be assigned to a different panel on another day but it didn't seem to, to pose any particular problems so I think in practice it would I can't see that it wouldn't work there might be challenges to it but ultimately if you had rules setting out what happened where there was a challenge there's no reason why there should be any particular difficulties thank you thank you uh, Rona thank you convener good morning um, just want to ask you a bit more about judicial independence um, the, the Lord President of the Scottish Government argued that um, judges shouldn't be treated in the same way as um, other branches of government because they have independent role protect, protected in statute. You've said you believe in judicial independence, so you don't think that a register would compromise that? No, I don't, because I think there's a very clear distinction between judicial independence, which is absolutely essential to a democratic society, and judicial accountability, which is also absolutely essential. And the two things are very different. So I would not like to live in a society in which politicians, for example, interfered in judicial decisions. And clearly that's why we have an independent judiciary. And I think we should all make sure that that is maintained. But accountability is a different matter altogether. I think being accountable for fair decisions is important. I think being demonstrating that you are impartial is an important part of accountability. So yes, we want impartial judges, but we want judges who can demonstrate that they're impartial. And to me, a register of interests is an opportunity to demonstrate that. And it actually enhances the judicial oath to me. It's saying not only do we have integrity, not only are we independent, 
Um, not only are we impartial, but we are demonstrating that. We have nothing to hide. Here are our interests laid out. Um, the, there's no conflict at all between independence and accountability. And do you have an opinion on why you think um, they're reluctant um, to, to have this register? I mean, do you think it's because they think they would be compromised or, or, do, or do they just not want to be accountable? Do, do you have any view on that, what, why, why they're resistant to this? I really don't understand it. I think traditionally um, the judiciary in Scotland is quite conservative with a small C, um, steeped in tradition. Um, those are not bad things in themselves. Um, but society has moved on and I think the judiciary has failed to keep in step with that. And I think the benefit of this is it's an opportunity for the judiciary to think, well, actually, we are in the 21st century. We do need to start doing some of the things that other people in public life do in the 21st century and have done for quite a few decades now, which is to be more open about our interests. So I don't know what the reluctance is. I'm not saying that, that judges have anything to hide. I'm simply saying that let's be more positive about this and just show that we don't have anything to hide. So it should come down to them, just a resistance to change and, and sticking yes. with the traditional way of, of doing I, things. I suspect that's yeah. it. It's just a natural... I mean, I think we can all be a little bit resistant to change and sometimes need a bit of encouragement to go along with that. OK, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I was looking at the risk of uh, abuse angle because, you know, a lot of this on, on the surface sounds absolutely sensible and then when you get down to the detail, maybe not absolutely agree, JP's not on the list does seem very strange when they're dealing with a local community. There could well be connections there and that certainly seems something that needs looked at. But can I maybe just go a little bit into the detail if you're, you're looking at a judge's private life and give you an example for example say someone has blocked a judge um, his car um, and he can't get out and he's been rude to them uh, would that be the nothing to do with the case no no um, connection to that person would that be a complaint that would be upheld because he's the judge he shouldn't be rude to, to anyone or? I think it's quite common in all, all sorts of um, roles for one's conduct in one's private life to be subject to complaints. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that as an MSP. You know, that, that MSP's behaviour in their normal life or board members' behaviour in their normal life can be subject to complaint, just as doctors, nurses, dentists, a whole range of professional groups um, can have complaints made about them because of their conduct out with their day job. So I think that's just... That's just normal. But in a way, I, I don't see the connection between that and a register of interest. I mean, that's part of the complaints process. It's the sort of complaint that I suspect wouldn't be looked at. Um, again, I mean, I have seen similar complaints not looked at by um, the judicial office. Back to the JCR's powers, and you, you said that should extend to looking at their private life and their conduct in, in private life. Well, the the rules um, can the rules that um, that govern complaints against the judiciary in Scotland do cover that. So um, people can make complaints about judges' um, conduct in their private life as well as their conduct in the courtroom. So that that is allowed at the moment. But the reality is that very few conduct complaints out complaints out with the courtroom progress in my experience as, J as former JCR. Right, and I, I wonder then um, about every complaint should be published, the outcome should be published, whether it was upheld or not. Is that potentially open to abuse given people can make vexatious complaints if you are in a position of... Um, of power as, as judges are to determine people's liberty so should every single complaint be um, published whether it's upheld or not or should it perhaps be the complaints which are upheld that are published would that be a balance yes i know i have no issue simply with um, upheld complaints being published um, at the moment they're not 
Um, and clearly, if a, if a complaint has been upheld, um, yes, no, I don't. I don't think for one minute that any complaint of any nature should be published. But if something has gone through the whole process and at the end of that it's been upheld, then I don't quite understand why that isn't published in the way that it is in England and Wales or the way that it is in Scotland for other professional groups. Can I ask about the register a little bit more detail of that? What kind of things do you think should be included in the register, Aunt? Just now, I, mean, I think I read in your submission, was it relatives or in something you, you'd said in an interview that you thought relatives should be um, included? Yes, I, th I think that's right. I think if people have family connections within the legal world, then that ought to be declared. What you don't want is a scenario in which, say, a judge has a daughter who's a lawyer and they are in the same courtroom together because that um, could lead to a perception of bias one way or the other. So I think relevant family connections. So I, I, I'm not talking about having to spell out who your family members are and what they do, but simply if there is a connection within the legal field, within close family, then I think that ought to be declared because that is relevant to whether people can believe that there is a sense of fairness or not. But wouldn't that happen just now in that, you know, there could be no, uh, the judge could look and say, well, there's no relevant interest, my, my wife works for the NHS, but then a case comes in front and it is relevant to the NHS and they look at it and immediately say, sorry, there will be a conflict here. But to do it the way you're suggesting is to almost try and second guess what might be a registrable interest? Well, no, it isn't, because I don't think if, if um, a family member worked in the NHS, that would be a registrable interest. That would be dealt with by a recusal at the time. And I think there is a need for both. So I think a relevant interest would be a legal link, for example, somebody working in a different part of the legal system or the criminal justice, the wider criminal justice system. I think that would be the sort of um, family connection that would be registered in advance. But I think if it then transpired that it was a case, for example, against the NHS and somebody's family member worked in the NHS, that would be dealt with by way of recusal. Um, can I perhaps look at this in a wider um in a wider sense, our judges, you know, are the ultimate upholders of, of, of the law and they can give um, life sentences. Um, they're involved with people that you and I would not like to meet on a daily basis. We already know our prisons are battling against serious and organised crime. Do you have any concerns about, you know, the kind of level of detail that you are asking in the register of interest to be submitted could in fact put our judges in a position where they did feel threatened and were in fact threatened. I don't understand how that could happen. I mean, for example, in my job at the moment with the Crown Prosecution Service, I deal with complaints from defendants, um, complaints from people who are in prison or who've committed very serious crimes. I have publicly available registers of interests on a number of different websites. Um, it, it's all available, anybody can look it up. I don't understand how that would lead to threats being made. It, it certainly hasn't happened for me. Um, I, I don't quite, I, I don't follow that argument at all. We suggest the judiciary are very different and very separate and should be from the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service. The judge is the ultimate determinant of a sentence he or she will decide if your liberty is going to be taken away from you and you're going to end up in prison. Now, that's serious. And therefore, do you have any concerns that the register of interest, as you're suggesting it should be, um, it should be implemented, would compromise that? No, I genuinely don't. I mean, I, I certainly would not be pushing for something that I felt put people in danger. And I cannot conceive of any situation in which a register of interests could be used in any way to place somebody in danger. It's simply a list of 
of interest, for example, if somebody owns a significant number of shares in a company or somebody is a member of a particular group or society that might impact on their judicial role or somebody who has family connections within um, the criminal justice system. It, it's simply about that. For a lot of judges, they publish that information anyway in different roles that they undertake. And it hasn't, to my knowledge, placed anybody in danger. So I, I'm afraid I think that's a complete red herring. I, I genuinely cannot see how a register of interests could be misused to put somebody in danger. I, I, I just can't see what information would be contained therein that would create that. I suppose my, my question to you is if they already give this detail and, and Mr. Chervy very helpfully provided information and I was quite struck by the, the level of detail that was disclosed already, including, I, I would um, say, the shares issue which you've already mentioned. So these things are covered just now. But we also know in this committee that serious organised crime and from our policing subcommittee are always a step ahead and it's always um, catching up with the, the latest way to put pressure on to look at where um, their, their activities can flourish and anything that's stopping that can be halted. And that's the difference between the Crown and Procurator. Do you accept there's a difference between the Judiciary and the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service? Yes, of course. But I suppose my response to, to your question is that I, if, if a serious um, criminal decided that they wanted to have a go at a judge because they'd been locked up by that judge, I don't think they'd be deterred by the fact that there wasn't a register of interest. I don't think they'd think, oh, well, I, I, I won't bother then. You know, if somebody's set their heart on doing somebody harm, then regrettably that's going to happen. It won't be prevented by there not being a register of interest that shows that judges are open and accountable. In fact, I think probably it's quite the reverse, that if judges' esteem is enhanced by the fact that they are operating more openly and transparently, that obviously raises their standard and enhances public trust and confidence in their role. Um, but if people are, are hell-bent on doing bad things, I'm afraid they're going to do those bad things, whether a register of interests exists or not. Um, so I, in a way, I don't, I don't quite follow the argument that's being made. It's a question of balance, just how much um, can you go towards making sure you've got maximum transparency and then how much if you go over um, the line and judges are required to um, to disclose so much about their, their potentially private life that it puts perhaps not them, but friends, relatives, they're open to uh, being blackmailed, whatever. All these things are possible. Have you thought about that at all? Yes, I have thought about that. And I think the answer is the same, that I don't... I mean, we're not asking judges to publish where they live or you, details that would place them in any danger. We're simply saying, you know, if you have business dealings that might be relevant to your role or you have family connections that might be relevant because they're part of the... You have family members who are part of the criminal justice system and that might cast doubt on your decision-making then that ought to be declared in a register of interest, just in the way that you and I also have to publish similar details that might impact on our role and perceptions about our impartiality. So it's sim it, it is the same. I don't believe it would create any danger or any difficulty. If I did, I genuinely wouldn't support it. I wouldn't wish to put anybody in danger, but I genuinely don't think that there would be any danger in that at all. I, I think quite the reverse. If, if, if trust is enhanced, then that surely has to be a good thing. And finally, could I ask you, if there was a failure to disclose, what would the sanction be? I think it would be the same as, uh, as happens now in that um, the complaint system would be used. I mean, a complaint would be lodged and it would be investigated. That, I mean, I'd like to see the complaint system change, but that's <laughs> perhaps that's for another day. But the, there is a clear complaint system, a clear set of rules, 
and that system would be used to investigate a complaint about a failure to declare an interest. Criminal offence? Well, it isn't at the moment. I mean, the complaints procedure at the moment is not a criminal process, and I'm suggesting that that could be used to investigate it. So, no, it would be an internal disciplinary matter for the judiciary. But again, I mean, I suppose my reluctance to be pinned down on detail is that this isn't my petition. I am here because I support in principle the notion of having greater openness and transparency. And a lot of these are detailed questions that I think would need to be teased out if the committee decides to take this forward. So in my view, it's workable because it works for other areas of public life. So it's a it's a workable proposal. The workings of that and the detail of that, I think, need to be determined. Um, and they're not really for me to answer. I think they're issues that the judiciary would need to look at and consult upon widely. But I see no reason why that couldn't work. And it wouldn't have to involve an extra layer of criminal process. I mean, the, the, the internal system could be used for that. For the avoidance of that, I think your, your, your testimony or your evidence today has been very helpful and I appreciate it's a, a principle, but for the committee I suppose the, the thing is the devil is in the detail and we have to look at the detail. But thank you very much, that was helpful. Liam Kerr and John Finney, supplementaries. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Yes, just a brief supplementary for me. And just for complete transparency, I am a practising solicitor registered with the Law Society of Scotland and England and Wales. Um, on an earlier point, the convener suggested that a register might increase uh, transparency and thus public confidence uh, in decisions. But one can formulate a scenario where a, a decision is handed down which, let's say, looks unduly lenient, and then uh, the register would suggest that a judge has another role that arguably you could run a line that said that other role has influenced the decision. At least the optics of it would look like that. In that scenario, doesn't that undermine confidence in the decision in a way that couldn't happen just now? I think there the may well be cases where that, that happens. And I think rightly, I mean, I think that people ought to be open to challenge and open to scrutiny. And I genuinely think that by and large, by, by laying that bare, by being open, you do enhance credibility. But I think you're right, there may well be occasions when people say, well, that's quite concerning because of that link. But do we not want a society in which people challenge things if they don't look right? It doesn't mean they're not right, but I think we do need, in all areas of life, to challenge things that don't appear on the face of it to be right. And Shona. No, oh, sorry, John, I've forgotten you were in with the supplementary. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> <Give me that. coughs> Excuse me. It's all right. Um, uh, Miss Ali, so I beg your pardon. Um, we're three weeks short of seven years since this petition was first decided here. Actually, what, what we are doing here is uh, taking evidence from witnesses, and we have had written evidence on that. Um, the original petition related to pecuniary interests. Um, and uh, although a lot has been said about bad guys and all sorts of threats, that's more likely to perhaps surface in civil cases rather than necessarily criminal cases which judges deliberate over. I wonder if you'd care to comment on, given your experience of the various other bodies, whether you think there's been any reputational damage to our judiciary by their apparent resistance to move on something that's seen as very, very matter-of-fact in many jurisdictions, namely that there's openness and transparency. I think there has been damage, yes. I think you just have to look at, at the headlines in the newspapers to see that. I think, without a shadow of a doubt, the perception that has been created is that there is something to hide. I think that's unfortunate, because I suspect in the majority of cases there isn't anything to hide. And that's why I don't understand the resistance to this. I think it is just a concern about things changing and a lack of acceptance of that. So yes, I think damage has been caused. Um, I think there is nothing to lose by publishing interests. I think it would definitely enhance the standing of the judiciary and would build public trust and confidence because at the moment the nature of the headlines is, well, what is there to hide? And then people dig around to try to find out. 
But if it were all published, then that would put a stop to that. Thank you. Thank you. Shuna. Uh, good morning. Uh, Lord uh, Carloway uh, has uh, said that... Uh, uh, register of financial interests could have a damaging effect on judicial recruitment. Um, so I just wondered what your view was, not that necessarily anyone would have anything to hide, but it may be a perception of that extended scrutiny. Do you think it could have a negative effect on uh, judicial recruitment in any way? I honestly don't think that it would. Um, I have to say that if, if a lawyer were put off by having to be open and transparent, it does raise questions about their suitability to be members of the judiciary. So I think if it, if it put people off, that might not be a bad thing because they might not be the sort of people we want sitting in judgment. But by and large, having to register interests has not put off very large numbers of people from wanting to sit on public boards or people from wanting to have a career in politics. So it has not deterred me. It has not deterred you. We are all here today and we all publish registers of interests. So I don't understand that that necessarily follows that people would be put off from becoming judges. People do that because it's a public service. It's a very worthwhile thing to do. And I would hope that the sort of people who want to do that would want to do it in an open and transparent way. Thank you. Liam Kerr and then Fulton McGregor supplementary. Uh, just on that point, I, could there be even a theoretical possibility that let's say Scotland has a register, but I think England currently doesn't in the same way as being mm -hmm. proposed. Isn't it then at least theoretically possible that England becomes a more attractive jurisdiction in which to become a judge uh, if one doesn't share that degree of transparency that perhaps uh, would be ideal? You could apply that um, argument in reverse because at the moment members of the judiciary in England and Wales have a very robust complaint system and findings against them are published on a website. It hasn't caused hordes of members of the judiciary to move north of the border to avoid that. So I think, no, it wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, it's a supplementary one on the earlier point, probably more around uh, transparency. I'm interested in how um, this register may um, impact on the communities that we, we represent. We often hear that certain communities have less, less faith in the criminal justice system as a whole. Uh, perhaps that's relating to religion or ethnicity or age or social demographics. How do you think that um, a register might impact um, and, and that transparency might impact on um, certain groups? I think it would impact very positively. I think you're quite right. There are groups, a number of different groups in society who, um, who are suspicious of the judiciary who feel that it's a closed world and it's all very um, incestuous and it's a world that they're not familiar with. And there is a lot of um, concern about judicial decisions and I think it could only have a positive impact. I think that if you have a group of people who say, we're not going to do that. We're not going to be open about that. Yes, you're open about that, but we're not going to. I think that creates a suspicion that there's something to hide. And I think by saying there is nothing to hide, and we're quite happy to publish this, I think that can do nothing but enhance um, the standing of judges across society. And in, and in your role, have you had um, any, any examples of where that um, might have played out had there been a register of interest um, in place? It's difficult to think of specific examples, but in general terms, I would say that when people get to the stage of escalating their complaint through to the very top of, of a complaint system, whatever it is, whether it's about the police or prosecutors or judges, they have lost faith by the time they reach the top of that um, the, the top of the scale of the complaint system. People have lost faith um, in the process. So I think that anything that can restore faith is a good thing. Um, so 
while I couldn't think of specific examples of where a register of interest would have helped, I think in general terms it would have helped because it's, it's all about building the standing of judges and clearly a register of interest would build that and therefore I think would lead to less sort of less of a perception that there was something to hide, uh, whatever that may be. Thank you. That concludes our questioning. Can I thank you very much for what's been a very worthwhile um, session today and for appearing all on your own without the petitioner here as well. Thank um, you. That concludes um, the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be Tuesday 26th of November when we will begin our consideration of the Children's Scotland Bill. Bill, we now move into private. <laughs>